Concerning the Grizzlies this season, eight wins in 48 games. The conditioning of Brian Reeves. Big country, remember him? Remember that draft pick? <laughs> Should have got uh, Brian Reeves. Mr. Brian Reeves, number 50. I remember him being pretty mediocre, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, because he was a stiff. What do you think is the reason there? Is he just, like, not work out enough in the summer and just a slow starter? What's the problem there? He wasn't committed. He liked to eat, like me. Yeah. So I understand where he was coming from. My very first year, I walked in the door and said, what moron signed big country? He's too slow, he's out of shape, and he doesn't look intimidating. He was successful because he was big, but nobody ever saw him as a, as a great basketball player. And we look at him seven foot and, and that big, you know, the, the buzz haircut, and we just sort of think he's a brute and an oaf. But he wasn't. He was a skilled basketball player. You know, he just got saddled with a bad rap. I think he worked hard. I think there was a lot of pressure on him. The Vancouver Grizzlies have been playing some of their better basketball of the season, although you wouldn't know it by looking at the wins and losses. They have lost 23 of their last 26. Big Country not shooting the ball with any confidence at this stage. Big Country with his lowest scoring average of his career. And so do you know where Bryant is today? I have no clue where Big Country is. Nope. I haven't seen him lately. I don't know. And do you know where Big Country is? No, I, I don't. I really don't care. Excuse me, excuse me. No, sorry. I'm trying to look for Big Country. Does anybody know where Big Country is? You guys, look, look at this. It's my Grizzlies Barbie. Barbie. Barbie was one. Basketball slippers. Does anyone need basketball slippers? Aw, I forgot how cute this was. My aunt got me a bunch of these. This is pretty cool. Oh my gosh, I have a, I have a box that's just labeled B-balls right now. Another one, Space Jam one. Oh, awesome. Look, it's my Grizzlies clock. I should actually use this. All my diaries growing up as a in high school. All the media guides from every year. Bright Reeves artwork here. These are all the games that I went to as a kid with my, my brother and my dad and my grandfather as well. Poems of basketball, 50. That's, that's actually like Bryant Reeves number 50. Grizzlies, exciting, fun, dribbling and running. I love this game, makes me feel cool. I'm a pretty good poet. And then I actually wanted um, I wanted my birthmark to be the next Nike sign. <laughs> it's right here, the blob. I mean, wouldn't you wanna buy the shoe with this blob on it? I think so. So it's, if it's not obvious, uh, I kinda like basketball. I kinda like the Vancouver Grizzlies. And I was obsessed with it. I really, it was like a part of my identity. But I have to clean this up now. In 1995, when I was seven years old, Vancouver got an NBA team, the Grizzlies. I loved them. Big Country was their star player. Seeing them play inspired me to dream big and follow my own basketball dreams, like being the first woman to play in the NBA. Tragically, after just six seasons, new owners took the team and moved them to Memphis, Tennessee, where they don't even have real grizzly bears. And 17 years later, there's almost no trace of the grizzlies in Vancouver. It's as though they were never here. Maria, yeah. do you know if there are any grizzlies banners? I've never heard. I've I think there's one at the sports hall of fame. Oh, okay. okay. They, should, they should have at least like a... Something. Some sort of memorial to it, I think. Right? So the only remnant, one of two remnants left of the Vancouver Grizzlies are these hand dryers. So this is another remnant. NBA size pull-up bar, I think. I touched it. I touched it. I did it. You're telling me that Brian Reeves used this? I don't know for a fact, because I wasn't here, but probably, yeah. Take that as a yes. Welcome to the BC Sports Hall of Fame. 
Oh, the Canucks photos. Canuck stuff, Canucks. Okay, where is the where is the basketball stuff? Just a lot of hockey stuff. White caps. BC Lions. Oh wait, hold on. Here you go. The Vancouver Grizzlies 1950s rugby team. Okay, I see basketballs. Jeez, is this it? I uh okay, so out of everything here, and out of everything here, all these basketballs. The Grizzlies get one, one basketball. But that's, that's it, it's just one basketball. Not even a team photo, not even a proper plaque. Man, it's kind of sad. Can I ask you a question? Yep. Um, do you guys have any more Grizzlies stuff, or is it just? Unfortunately, I think that's it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we get a lot of really random donations, but yeah. nothing really Grizzlies. What happened to the memories of the Grizzlies? Is the city trying to erase them from history? Excuse me? Do you remember the Vancouver Grizzlies? I'm afraid not, I don't remember them. I don't remember them that well. Do you remember the Grizzlies? No. Do you know what those shorts are? No. Do you guys remember the Grizzlies? I don't. None of them? No. Maybe that's because they weren't as amazing as my childhood memories. In fact, they were a total disaster. And so it continues. The Grizzlies still looking for their 20th victory, something we thought they'd get weeks ago. And now, though, that team is struggling. Well, the Grizzlies have lost 16 of 17. We lost 29 in a row. We're known as the worst professional sports team franchise in history. There were years when we were setting records for the most losses. Once again, the Grizzlies lose a heartbreaker here at the Alamo Dome. Grizzlies need some help now. They need some to light them up because they've been miserable in their last two ball games. I've never seen us have so many easy shots and not be able to make them. You've seen good times and bad times, and, and right now, the Grizzlies in the, in the midst of the bad time. But what hurts the most is not all the losing. It's that so many fans blamed Big Country. Who's your favorite Grizzly player? Is it a Big Country? No. But Big Country has never spoken publicly about his time in Vancouver. And even though many reporters have tried, no one has seen or heard of him since the Grizzlies left town. So, where is he? Okay, let's see. Hello, hello. When I first started looking for Big Country, I started by reaching out to other members of the Grizzlies. His teammates, the coaching staff, the team management, even the team mascot, Trevor Jones, better known as the Grizz. And do you know where Big Country is now? Uh, I have no idea. He ended up going on uh, an injured list, right? Yeah, yeah, he's a bad back. And, and then it's like no one ever heard of him from that point on. So Stu, so do you, do you know, like have you kept in touch with him? Like do you know where he, he is these days or what happened to him? No, I, I don't keep in touch with him. Uh, I keep in touch with Sharif. I have no idea what Big Country is. Uh, from time to time, I run into Mike Bibby. Mike, do you know where uh, where Country is these days? Like how I could reach him? No, no clue. Hey, is this Rusty's phone? I'm sorry, what? Oh, sorry, I think I had the wrong number. Okay. Damn it. No one knew where Big Country was, and I started to doubt myself. Oh, damn it, baby. Maybe I'm the one who screwed up. Maybe this is a dumb idea. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Maybe I'm wasting everybody's time. So yeah, right now we're trying to find Big Country, so if anyone has any leads, um, please let me know. We're trying to find Big Country. Maybe Big Country doesn't want to be found. I should just forget it. Besides, my phone bill was getting out of control. But in my darkest moment of despair, I found an online article that briefly mentioned how Big Country was back home in Gans, Oklahoma. Bingo. I reached out to the author, Barry Trammell, who told me Big Country is a hard guy to get a hold of, but my best bet is to pack my bags and head for Oklahoma. Oh, that's so cool. The legend of Big Country lives on in this Big Country pizza, Canadian bacon. 
The legend of big country is a guy who went from country bumpkin to a beloved superstar, and a guy that most people thought couldn't play to being an All-American. He had the crew cut, he had the, uh, the Oklahoma twang, he had the fishing stories. He was big and he was country. It's the perfect nickname. Still today, 25 years later, you talk to anybody in sports uh, and say, who's big country? And they'll remember Bryant Reeves. Big country. Bryant Reeves has made a big impression on the basketball world, especially at OSU. And at seven foot plus, you have an opportunity of making a big impression. He's a man from a very small town making that big impression. Well, Gans is a tiny place. I mean, Gans, uh, now I haven't been in a long time, but I don't think it's changed much. Where Bryant's from is not a, a bastion of great high school basketball. Nobody had ever heard of Gans until big country. I mean, Gans had no athletic background, no sports uh, success to stand on. And the truth is, really haven't had any sense. But, uh, you know, but he was just a normal person uh, that, uh, you know, happened to be really good at something, and that something was basketball. And he got to Oklahoma State, and just day after day, game after game, he just improved, improved, and, and became one of the all-time greats. A seven-foot freshman from Gans, Oklahoma. They call him Big Country. Number 50, Bryant Reeves. I think people don't understand how good of a fundamental basketball player he was. He had great footwork. He'd be able to spin and get his shot off, and it was impossible to uh, defend. He started averaging 20 points a game. Uh, he hit a half-court shot at the buzzer against Missouri to send the game into overtime and send Gallagher Iba Arena into delirium. He was the uh, two-time Big Eight Player of the Year, uh, set all kinds of Oklahoma State records, scoring and rebounding, broke the backboard in the uh, Final Four practice on Friday. He brought down the backboard, and big country was on the highlight reel across the country. A few pieces of glass had to be pulled out of the back of the neck of Reeves, but other than that, he was okay. And the legend of big country had grown even bigger. You know, there are people walking around still with uh, the charge of glass. You know, some people picked it up and passed it out to friends or sold it. OSU fans today who have a piece of that glass consider it prized memorabilia. And when he got to the NBA in 1995, they were still playing uh, big man basketball. So it was probably the perfect time for him to get there. Not only was Barry Trammell a great storyteller, but he also gave me the contact information for some more people who knew Big Country, and I set off on a mission to chase them down. I was getting closer to Big Country. I could almost smell him, metaphorically speaking. You couldn't ask for a better story than a small town kid making it big and playing with the best of the best in the NBA. God blessed him. God blessed him with height. But Bryant has some good hands, very good hands for a big man, very good hands. Bryant was always known for his great hands. Big hands, big body. He had great hands and he had great touch. And soft hands. Great hands, really soft hands um, and, and, and pretty good feet. Well, Bryant was proof that, hey, just because you're a small town doesn't mean if you're talented and you're willing to work hard, you can make something of your life. You can go do something special. So this is Brian's childhood home. I don't think anyone lives here anymore. This is pretty cool. This is Brian's childhood court. So, if, I mean, essentially, this is where it all began. You know, Gann's a small community, so you know everybody and everything. Yeah. But I know Brian ever since he's a little boy. My mom had him in Head Start. Okay. And he wasn't little then. He was still. He was, he was big, still big. He was a big boy was, then. Was he always? Was he always tall? He was always tall. Yes, Brian was always tall. He okay. was always tall. Yeah, but I used to get tickled because. Uh, Every day, probably when Bryant was in the fifth grade, I'd come home, I'd be driving by here about the time school got out. And so there would be Bryant, dribbling that basketball. No matter if it was raining, snowing, whatever, he was dribbling that basketball home. 
counselor. I said, Brian, what's your goals? He said, I'm going to play in the NBA. And he didn't say, I want to play in the NBA. He said, I'm going to play in the NBA. Bryant Reeves was not only a great college player, he was an excellent NBA player. He wouldn't have gotten that contract had he not been a, uh, an excellent player. His first couple of years, I mean, he put up good numbers. I mean, he had 40 points in Boston and another 40 at whatever it was at Chicago. People don't remember he really had good numbers uh, the years that he was able to play after that first three years after his rookie contract was up. Uh, that's why they signed him to the extension that they did. Brian Reeves, the $60 million man for Vancouver, earning that paycheck today. Reeves, the second highest scoring center in the, the NBA behind only Shaquille O'Neal. If you had to narrow it down to just one, big country. <laughs> Big cut? Why? Because guards that don't play defense, they always tell bigs to show. So I would show, and he had the ugliest Duckworth one-hand jumper. He shoot it and it always go in. And till halftime, I'm looking at the stats. Shaq, 15, Big Country, 26. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> the, the size of them basketball players is just unbelievable in the NBA. Them guys are, them guys are, they are huge and they're athletic and they can move and they can shoot. Well, you know, Bryant's going to be good to me because, I mean, he's going to be a good ball player to me because I'm, I'm partial to him, you know. Yeah. You know, I think he's the best. Yeah. Man, when he went up against him, guys, yeah. whew, he's good. Yeah. He's good. He was, excuse my emotions, but yeah. he was, I cried because a kid from Gans, Oklahoma, Man, he's good. He was good. I mean, because he was playing against the best of the best. He wanted to prove that he was one of the best basketball players in the world. He wanted to work hard to get to that point. I mean, you can't just be a tall person and be swatting balls and not have the ability to score, rebound, shoot. So, you know, he's one, you know, one in a million or more millions. I don't know how many people play basketball, but it's, it's no small feat to get to the NBA and to get a contract. But, you know, one thing that he always demonstrated excellences was his relationship and engagement whenever he was in the community. He was good to people. He was good to children. He was always helping out. And they all have a story to tell about something that, you know, that he inspired them to do. So, yeah, so, like, how big of a Grizzlies fan was I as a kid? Do you remember? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're a pretty huge Grizzlies fan. I, I, more than me, actually. And still, to this day, loyal to the Grizzlies in terms of your passion and your, your enjoyment of the Grizzlies. So do you think this is a healthy obsession? No. <laughs> There's a connection between Cat and Big Country because he was our star player. Going to those games and seeing him play especially as we were kids, really was something to remember. And I think that was a big part of why she was a huge super fan for the Grizzlies. And so, um, how good was I as a kid? Well, I like to think that I taught you a lot of the skills that you have, you know, so you're welcome. But yeah, you're, you're pretty good, you're pretty damn good. And you're definitely better than me. In high school, Cat's position in basketball was the starting point guard. Kathleen Jamie. But Kathleen was so small compared to all the other players. Our mom would be terrified when she'd play basketball. And rather than cheering, my mom would just be screaming in horror when Kathleen would drive down the lane. That's how, that's how tiny she was. But despite being the tiniest player on the court, I thought Kat was the best on her team. I remember watching her, I don't know if it was her grade 11 game or grade 12 game, but she 
scored 60 pointers in a row and it was just unbelievable. Like basket after basket, she was just draining threes left, right, and center. And there's there's literally nothing the other team could do. You can see how passionate and excited she was for every game. There's this clipping, that I think, from a newspaper that they took of Kat. And uh, it's her screaming, and you can see the elation and her teammates behind her. So I think that really shows just how much basketball means to her, how passionate she is for the game. After high school, I went to university and tried out for the UBC women's team. I was ready to take my basketball dreams to the next level. So I always had this fear that I'm not gonna play. And lo and behold, it might, it might be because I, I actually didn't play well, or it might be because compared to them, I'm not as good. I don't know. I know that I, I didn't show any of the things that I'm capable of. Um, so yes, I, I, I got cut. It just hurts. Because I was that close. It was so fun to dream. To wonder, what if? But now it feels like it's no longer a possibility. Playing the WNBA to forever just be a dream. I guess to have a career cut short like that, having to I guess you could say yes, give up on the dream, not maybe because it was your choice, but because of the circumstances. I think it, it's important to Kat to tell Big Country's story because in a way she's telling her own story. And of course, Brian Reeves on the other end. Now here's a guy who came into the league as a very solid low post scorer. Had a nice rookie year, nice first couple of years, but the last year he's spent much of this year being injured. Last year, of course, with lockout, he came in over shape and was pretty ineffective. Had a knee injury that ended, for all intents and purposes, his fourth year. And he has missed 10 games this year with a sore knee. Big guys often fight uh, a lot of uh, health issues that the rest of us don't really understand. Big country comes up limping on the play. I guess over the years, he growed so fast and stuff that his back, his back stretched or whatever, and then he had some disc problems playing in the NBA. And uh, one morning he woke up and he couldn't he couldn't get out of bed and his son Trey was a baby and he couldn't pick him up. I remember the last conversation I had with him. I think it was kind of sad because after his back issues, like John, you don't know what it's like to not be able to pick up your kids and just play with them. It was pretty sad to hear him say those kinds of things as a young father, right? You know, doctors told him that he wasn't able to play anymore. If he wanted to pick his kids up or if he wanted to be able to get out of bed, he'd have to hang it up. Basketball was one of those dreams, and all of a sudden it was taken away. That's what he had done for most of his life. It, it hurt him when he couldn't play no more. It bothered him. It really did, because he, he didn't know nothing but basketball. He loved the game. So it's just an unfortunate story. You know, the Grizzlies uh, loaded up the truck and, and paid Bryant Reeves heavy, and not long after that, his back went out, and uh, the production wasn't there, and the playing time wasn't there, and, and it cost the Grizzlies big time. The uh, Grizzlies are well aware of the perception that the Raptors have of them, that being a losing basketball team, and, and the record doesn't do anything to dispel that. Shantonio Davis in a post right away to use his quickness against Big Country, who's been struggling with his legs. But how can you fault a guy for signing that contract and then and then getting hurt and ending, ending his career. We see it all the time. It's kind of a sad story the way it ended because it didn't end the way Bryant would have wanted it to end. I think he was just misunderstood. I think that for fans, I think sometimes, you know, they want to hold an, an athlete or an individual responsible for the whole package. And you know, Big Country was an easy one to pick because he did not necessarily look the typical part of an NBA player. You know, he didn't have a, a swagger. He didn't dress the coolest. 
He had that Oklahoma lilt. And so when he left the glaring world of the NBA, I think he retreated. Hopefully you can interview Brian or anything like that. Like I said, he's kind of a quiet, shy man. It's, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of, I mean, I don't think it's anything personal against you or anything. He's just, he just, yeah. he's not one of them type of people is what I'm trying to say. If you have any trouble, you can tell him, say, hey, I just want you to be perfectly honest with me. That's all I'm asking. Because yeah. he, he might. I don't know if he yeah. will or not. I yeah, yeah, I yeah. Know. I can't speak for him. For sure. So just do it, OK? Thank you so much, Y'all be careful. I will. Thank you. OK, it's happening. It's happening. I've never been this close <laughs> to an NBA player. So yeah, I'm nervous. <laughs> So if you're looking for a big country, he lives right outside of Gans. But uh, to actually get to his house, you have to know uh, exactly where you're going. OK, that's not it for sure. It says dead end, but should we just keep going? You know, I could sit here and, and try to tell you how to find his house, and you would never find it. Uh, it's, it's hidden. A little rusty. Maybe I'll call. Should I call Rusty? Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. OK, so maybe Big Country wasn't as easy to find as I thought. For a seven-foot guy, he's done a pretty good job of hiding. We've been after him for a decade to go fishing with him, but he's not outgoing. He's not going to seek you out. you got to find him if you want to talk to him. Our GPS and Google Maps, they're not working, so I. Okay, this must be it. Whoa, OK. Whoa, that's crazy. Can you see the Oh, my gosh, this is. You got, this is. So, Brian, uh, where have you been these past few years? Um, have you just been here? And uh... I've been here. Um, you know, I, I was never one that wanted the attention. You know, I, I didn't care for all the attention. Um, you know, I was, I was very comfortable. I didn't go nowhere. I've, you know, been here since, um, since I was done playing. Moved here in 2002. 2002. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, this is the man cave here. <laughs> This is amazing. Brian, this is like. Those are trays. This, this one? Yeah, that is super cool. The super Grizz. You can take it out. I don't think there's anything off limits. That is, that is cool. It's all great stuff, you know? I mean, it all has a special place. And why 50? Uh, it, was, it was the biggest jersey they had. <laughs> yeah. That's how it started, you yeah. know, all the way in the sixth grade. The higher the number, the bigger, and yeah. then it just kind of stuck with it. Yeah. Uh, got the got the tickets for the first year. Super Sonics are in there, I think. Oh, wow. Corn pops. <laughs> this is so great. I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that that one is empty. <laughs> See, those are Warner Brothers trying to make those. Brian, would it be okay if I put one of these f shoes on? I don't care. <laughs> See, it looks weird for you, but but if I tried to put your <laughs> shoes on, it'd look weird on me. This is hilarious. Right, this is so cool. Thank you so much for. Uh... <laughs> Actually, we don't come down here very often anymore. You know, American. Everybody, my kids are doing different stuff, and yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. Grizzlies first game and their first win. And only one member of the Grizzlies team now was on the team back then, Brian Reeves. He's been here since the start through thick and thin. You know, there comes a point in time where probably everybody questions, you know, are the players doing what they what they should be doing or trying to win or, you know, I, I, I promise you, you know, every time you locked in that locker room, you know, we wanted to win more than anybody did. Did you ever want to get traded? No, never asked for a trade. How come? You know, I, 
I, I love Vancouver, you know, I mean, I was home there. It was, uh, it was a great city, you know, my family loved it there. You know, I got to see a lot of the world live in a, you know, a whole nother country for a short time. It was all great because of the game of basketball. At the same time, I knew this was where we wanted to be. We wanted to raise our family here and that we were gonna turn the rest of it into, uh, you know, a cattle ranch. We run a cow-calf operation, so, you know, we keep all the uh, grown cows and, you know, sell the, sell the offspring every year. It was something that I wanted to do, uh, you know, after I got done playing. You know, I'd always been outdoors hunting, fishing, but we never had a ranch. My uh, parents couldn't afford one. So I wanted to be able to enjoy the outdoors and to work outside. You know, every, every day is different. You know, those, those cows uh, have a mind of their own. They don't always want to do what you want to, but you know, at the same time, I'm, you know, I'm outside, I'm by myself or with a couple of guys, and you know, it just makes it a, a nice, peaceful day. Never seen such big poop. Yes. <laughs> well, good. You got, yeah. you got your slickers on. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Natural fertilizer. That's, that's what they call that's that. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of everywhere. Um, so, Brian, is this is this a piece of heaven for you right here? It is. Um, you know, this is uh, very nice, very peaceful. I enjoy it out here. It, it, in, in my opinion, it don't get a whole lot better uh, nowadays for me. So this is a a way to get away from everyday life and uh, enjoy what I do. I guess you'll be doing this for uh, like for for forever. the rest forever. Yeah, there there's always there'll always be something to do, some fence to replace, some fence to fix, some cow to mess with. Um, you know, this is just a never-ending uh, never-ending job. You know, luckily I do have these guys, so uh, they they kind of pick up the slack when I have to bail on them to go to games and stuff like that. So it's uh, always nice to have that around. Would you say this is your new sort of I know release? Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it is. Um, you know, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy being out here. Um, you know, it's always nice when you have people to talk to. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a lone rat. I don't like big crowds, but I always like to be able to BS with somebody and, yeah. and have a good time. If I never made it to the NBA, I'm sure I'd be happy because I would have known that I tried and gave everything I had to get there, you know, which is, is all you could ask for. I never wanted to play for 20 years, but, you know, at the same time, I wanted to play longer than what I did. It was tough coming to terms with that. We were all ready to go in Memphis. Um, went in for training camp and, um, you know, played, it, played in a couple of exhibition games there, and that was uh, the end of it. I was medically discharged, or however you want to say it there. It's spinal stenosis, there's bulging discs, there's herniated discs. Um, you know, it's not just one thing. But, you know, when you put your body through that kind of physical toll, night in and night out, I mean, it's going to take a toll on everyone. That was my life, that was my career. And you know, anytime you um, have something like that taken away from you, you know, it, it, it takes a while to adjust. You know, I think what made it maybe a little easier for me was knowing that, um, you know, I didn't have a choice. It just wasn't in the cards. Basketball was a part of me, it was a huge part of my life. But, you know, I'm very content in being where I'm at today um, and doing what I'm doing now. How does it get so big, though? Like, the poop is so big for, well, for like... You, you, okay, those cows are 12, 1,300 pounds. So when they poop, they're going to poop a lot. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, you... <laughs> yeah, fall elephant. That poop's small for an elephant or a rhino. <laughs> yeah. how Big Country had happily continued on with life after basketball. Hanging out with him on the ranch made me wonder, if I hadn't been cut from my university team, 
then maybe I wouldn't have pursued my other passion of being a filmmaker. And if that hadn't happened, then I wouldn't be here today about to play basketball with big country Bryant Reeves. That's not bad out here. You're wearing shorts and a short sleeve <laughs> shirt, and I'm wearing a hoodie. I'm getting ready, ready to play. <laughs> I know, I'm still cold. <laughs> when was the last time you, you played, do you think, Bryant? Seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Had me do something I ain't done in forever. Thank you. Been too long. <laughs> Woo! You better got that one, because that might be the only one you get. <laughs> it's game time, Bryant. <laughs> one on one? Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, really, <laughs> really easy. All right. <laughs> Woo! Good ball again. <laughs> I'm not gonna be here. <laughs> oh. Now it's gonna get serious. <laughs> oh. It's so risky when you meet one of your childhood heroes because, you know, they didn't ask to be that in your life and you kind of put them on this pedestal and so there's a very high probability that they're not going to meet the expectations that you have, but Bryant has exceeded mine 100%. It, this is really a childhood dream come true. This is a dream come true for me. So, uh, was you a good high school player? Uh, I, I'd, I'd say so. I think so. Was you probably college? I, I did not play college. Uh, that was uh, that was the first time I'd been cut from a basketball team, and uh, it took a it took a while to figure out if I still want to play basketball, if I want to keep going, or if uh, I want to just you know hang my jersey and, and uh, pursue filmmaking full time. Failing is tough, but. If you don't fail at something, you can't succeed at it either. Somebody's always gonna criticize what you do, whether it's on the court, whether it's in everyday life. I mean, somebody's always gonna second guess you. You know, you just gotta tune that crap out and just go on about your stuff. I don't miss basketball now at this point in my life. It was excited to be a part of the NBA at that time. Yes, it wasn't always the greatest. We didn't win a championship. You know, if you want to blame me, that's fine. If you want to blame Sharif or Bibby or whatever, but you know, I mean, it, it takes, uh, you know, 12 guys out there to make it happen, to win or lose. You know, basketball is just a game at the end of the day. It's an entertainment, you know, it's not, you know, life or death. You know, my basketball career was great, but I don't think your basketball career or playing in the league can ever take precedent over um, you know, where you stand with your family. Friends and family at the end of the day are, are what you have. You know, I mean, that's what you have in life. The most important thing in my life now is my kids. You know, they're, 
they're only here for a short time. Um, then they become, you know, hopefully good citizens and grown adults. So you want them to be able to succeed in life no matter where it is or what they do. You know, looking back, I'm glad I did what I did. I'm glad I was able to do and given the opportunities to play in college, to play in the NBA. You know, it was a dream come true. I wouldn't have had it any other way. present Big Country Bryant Reeves. Look at that shoe. Wow. <laughs> These are excellent additions to awesome. the Hall of Fame collection. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Nice yeah. meeting you as well. Does everyone like basketball?